Now, David gives some advice to Solomon, kind of as a father would give to his son. In chapter 2, verse 2 and following, this is an interesting passage. The time drew near for David to die. He gave charge to Solomon, his son. And this is what David, these are the last words of a father to his son. Do you remember the last words of a father to a son when your father dies? Yes, you remember those words forever. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong and show yourself a man. Interesting there, strength. and This, this verse is not politically correct, right? Be strong, show yourself a man. What does it mean to me, a man in our culture? Okay, this is very politically incorrect. And also, I love it though. <laughs> And, also, and observe what the Lord requires of you. What does the Lord require of you? Walk in his ways, keep his decrees and his commands, his laws and his requirements, as written in the law of Moses. Is David aware of the law of Moses? Is David aware of the law of Moses? Now, some of your liberal critics will say what? The law of Moses wasn't written yet for 150 years with that JEDP stuff that we looked at. It wasn't written for 150 years. Question, is David aware of the law of Moses? And does David tell Solomon, you better keep your head in the law of Moses, the Torah, the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. What was the promise God made to David? David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. David, I will build you a house, and your house will last forever. And that one of David's sons would rule over Israel forever. We know that to be Jesus and going to the Messiah. And David comes to Solomon, but notice what he does here. There's a shift in the narrative here. The Lord may keep his promise to me. And he says, if, if your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully. Will some of Solomon's descendants walk faithfully with the Lord, Hezekiah, Josiah? But will most of them go away? And David is saying that the, the covenant to David is a conditional covenant in some aspects of it, that there's an if part to it. You've got to walk in the ways of the Lord. Otherwise, the Lord is not going to put your descendants on the throne the way he would have. So there's an if with David there, and that's interesting. Now, ultimately, will Jesus be on the throne forever and ever? Yes, that's going to happen because God gave his word. But David's descendants will participate in that at different levels according to their obedience. And so, now, David, David's an old man, and he says, okay, Solomon, you got to clean up the kingdom because there's certain things David didn't do. And so David gives Solomon his hit list, I call it. Um, and who's going to be his hit list? Let's see if we can just talk through these guys. I think you know them. Who has more blood on his hands than anyone else in David's kingdom? Joab. Okay, Joab was David's general, and Joab was a, killed Abner. Joab killed everybody in the narrative. Joab just kills people. Joab killed Absalom. And David says, Solomon, I'm a man of blood. you got to take care of this problem. Joab has blood on his hands. Now, by the way, you say, why didn't David take care of the problem? Why does he make his son do that? Is it very likely that Joab and David were good friends? They both grew up in Bethlehem together. They fought, they both ran from Saul together and fought together. And so these guys are like fighting buddies. They grew up together in, from, at Bethlehem. And so David's not going to do that to his friend kind of thing. But, but Joab has blood all over his hands. And so David says, you got to take care of it, Joab. Make sure his head doesn't go down in peace and stuff. And so what does Joab do? After Solomon takes over, Joab goes running into the tabernacle area, takes hold of the horns of the altar. And Solomon says, go in and kill him even there. Yeah, Joab needs, he, I don't want that blood on the kingdom and stuff. Chap, Shimei, does anybody know Shimei? That's a harder one. Shimei, does anybody remember who Shimei was? Okay, he's a, he's a minor character. Let me just tell you the story of Shimei. Absalom is coming up to, to, to defeat his father and to kill his father. Absalom is coming up to kill his father. David flees across the valley of Kidron here, up over you guys, the Mount of Olives. And as David's running over the Mount of Olives, who shows up but Shimei? He's a descendant of Saul. And he shows up and says, See, David, you're finally getting what, you know, you're getting what should be coming to you. In other words, David, you were a wicked guy against Saul, and now you're getting what's coming to you. So Shimei, 
curses David as David's fleeing from his son, and he's in a weak point, and so fleeing from his son, Shimei curses David. Now, could David have killed Shimei? He spared Shimei. David is merciful and spares him, but he's telling Solomon now, this guy cursed me, you, t- you take care of the business, okay? Now it won't be a vengeance. So Solomon, how does Solomon do Shimei? It's kind of interesting how he does them. He says, Shimei, I'm not going to take your life. But what I'll do is, if you ever leave Jerusalem, if you ever leave Jerusalem, I will kill you. If you ever leave Jerusalem, you can live in Jerusalem for the rest of your life. So what does one of Shimei's servants do? Shimei's servants runs away. What does Shimei do? He runs after a servant to bring him back to Jerusalem. Solomon finds out about it. Is Shimei dead? Yeah, that's what happens to Shimei. He ran after a servant. Solomon said, I told you not to leave the city, Shimei. And so, so Shimei is taken out. And then what about Adonijah? Adonijah has a problem. Um, do you remember when Abner and Ishbosheth were over here in Jordan? And Abner said, I want Ritzpah, the concubine of Saul. And Ishbosheth freaked out. It was like a play for the kingship. Adonijah, the son of David, says, I want Abishag. Remember that? pretty young woman that slept with David? Adonijah says, I want her now for my own. Is that a play for the kingship? That he can sleep with David, this woman that slept with David. And so it's believed then that Adonijah, when he said he wants Abishag, is making a plea for the kingship. And so Solomon says, you got to go, Adonijah. I can't, you know, that, that's not right. And so Adonijah takes, um, or Solomon takes Adonijah. With these people then, Solomon is basically purging the kingdom and making it... Uh, pure and so that he won't have blood on his hands and stuff. Now what's interesting in this narrative is what I'm going to demonstrate to you is that Solomon is wise before God gave him the wisdom. He's going to have a special dream that he's going to dream in chapter 3. He's going to go to Gibeon and he's going to dream. God's going to say, what do you want, Solomon? Solomon's going to say, I want to be wise and discerning and things. And God's going to be impressed with that and give him, he's going to make him wiser than anybody else in the world. But Solomon was wise before the dream. And David recognizes that his father, in chapter 2, verse 6, David says, deal with him, that is Joab, according to your wisdom, Solomon. Do not let his gray hair go down into the grave in peace. Solomon, deal with Joab according to your wisdom. David recognized that his son was wise. And and this is before the dream. And then if you go over to verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, again, before the dream where God gave him wisdom, it says, but now do not consider him innocent. This time it's talking about Shimei. You, Solomon, are a man of wisdom. David says to Solomon, you, Solomon, are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him. Bring his gray hair head down to the grave in blood. So Solomon was wise before the dream. Does God often do that with people? Take their gifts and enhance their gifts? It's not, it's not like Solomon was a fool before that. God actually enhances his wisdom. Now, this is where Solomon gets his wisdom. This is 1 Kings chapter 3 at the pool at Gibeon, or at the sacrificial place at Gibeon. Um, Solomon goes up there. He's offering sacrifices before the Lord. And God comes to Solomon in a dream. And basically, the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices. And at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God asked, ask whatever you want me to give you. Okay, now you know, if the genie comes out of the bottle and says, I give you three wishes, what is your third wish? Yeah, that's exactly right. You guys got to be smart about this, okay? You get three wishes, you do the first two wishes, anything you want. A third wish, you always ask for more wishes, okay? Here he said, basically, ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. Solomon answered, and this shows his wisdom, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful. And then like jump down a little bit. But I am only a little child. I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. Do you get the little dig there? People, too too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, to distinguish, to distinguish between right and wrong. Does the king have to make court cases to distinguish right and wrong? For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And the Lord was pleased with what Solomon asked for. And he says, hey, Solomon, you didn't ask for long life. You didn't ask for wealth. 
And God says, I'll give you those things as well. So Solomon dreams at Gibeon. It shows Solomon's humility. Solomon says, I'm just a little child. I don't know what to do, you know, how to judge between what's right and what's wrong and things. And so this is true humility in Solomon. Uh, by the way, is there going to be a tension between, have you guys seen this? A tension between intellect and humility. Are most intellectuals, you know, humble people? Or is it usually that when a person is bright, they get arrogant? Is it usually that when a person is bright, they get arrogant? And here you see Solomon having a humility. This guy is really pretty wise. Is, um, but the problem is, how old is Solomon? Solomon says, I'm only a child. Do you realize that at this point in Solomon's life, he's got a kid and a wife already? At this point in Solomon's life, it's not mentioned there if you have to put two and two together, but he's got a wife. And as a matter of fact, he's got a one-year-old son. When this happens, he's already got a one-year-old son, and he's got an Ammonitess wife already. Now, by the way, when I say Ammonitess, is this woman Jewish? She's not Jewish. Do you remember as you read the narrative in chapter 11, it's going to tell us that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and they led his heart astray. But when did Solomon, it tells you at the end of Solomon's life that he's got all these wives and concubines. But when Solomon started out, when, before the dream, before he even became king, basically, or just as he was becoming king, did he already have an Ammonitess wife and a, a one-year-old son? Because when Solomon dies... And Rehoboam, his son, takes over. His son is 41 years old. Solomon ruled for 40 years. Solomon ruled for 40 years, which means that his son was a year old, and she was born to an Ammonite. So Solomon already had the problem, but the, the narrative doesn't tell you the problem with the wives until later on in chapter 11. So, you know, you've got to work with the narrative and how that works there. 